Uh, I assume all of you can see me and hear me. Am I right? Once again, and I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, as usual, uh, the net and uh, the software and everything caused some delay, but let's start now and go ahead. So what I'm going to talk to you about the diagnosis of tetralogy of fallow. Now, somebody else is going to talk on the treatment part, so I won't be touching on that. And I'll try to make it as uh, comprehensive and as so examination oriented point of view as well as your practice point of view. Okay? So let's go on to the first slide. So all of you know what, what your, um, what tetralogy is all about. Unlike the earlier definition of four, and I had four anomalies, it's uh, only, uh, I'm sorry, one second. The, there is essentially only one major anomaly in tetralogy of fallow, and that is the anterior deviation of the infundibular septum. See that, that portion of the infundibular septum or the outflow septum does not join with the rest of the interventricular septum. It moves, oh, sorry, it moves anteriorly towards the right ventricle and superiorly towards the right ventricular outflow tract. Now this single defect causes all the problems. Now you can see that there is a gap in the ventricular septum that the classical tetralogy ventricular septal defect. When the infundibular septum moves anteriorly, there is development of narrowing of the right ventricular outflow and therefore pulmonary stenosis. And the rest of it is secondary, like uh, pulmonary stenosis and VSD will cause right ventricular hypertrophy. And because of the large VSD, the iota appears to partly arise from the right ventricle and partly arise from the left ventricle. So, especially tetralogy is actually a single defect. Okay. Now, because of the large BAG, the ventricular pressure in RV is the same as the LV and therefore the blood can flow either from LV to RV or RV to LV. As the degree of pulmonary stenosis increases here, more and more blood will be pushed towards the iota through the VST. Now, this blood may not necessarily go into the left ventricle. It will go straight from the right ventricle into the iota and that causes desaturation. Now, Therefore, tetralogy is a condition where the pulmonary blood flow is increased and there is a right to left shunt with increased flow into the aorta. Okay? So, it is a differential diagnosis of conditions causing diminished pulmonary blood flow. Now, one of the most common ways of classifying cyanotic heart disease is those with increased pulmonary blood flow and those with decreased pulmonary blood flow. I am putting this slide not because if people do not know that you already are aware of this. But then uh, one of the most frequently asked questions in the examination and it is not uh, a waste of time to go over it again. Ch children with uh, high pulmonary blood flow tend to be uh, poorly nourished because they have frequent respiratory infections, they are unable to feed, they are dyspneic, they spend more calories breathing, they are very sweaty. On the other hand, the child with diminished pulmonary blood flow often is hypoxic, he is not so active. If feeding involves relatively little calorie expense, so they are often well nourished or at least averagely nourished. They are often very sedentary, whereas the child with high pulmonary blood flow are often irritable, hyperactive and breathing hard. Cyanosis is often severe in the diminished pulmonary blood flow, whereas the large pulmonary blood flow, cyanosis if present should be very mild. Signs of a low pulmonary blood flow are a very quiet and not uh, enlarged heart, the heart size remains normal, whereas whenever there is a blood flow is increased in any part of the aorta or pulmonary artery, the heart becomes big, it is very active, no? precordium is dancing around very hyperkinetic active, active uh, pulsations over the precordium. Uh, there is no third or sound or gallop present in case of tetralogy like situation, whereas a large pulmonary blood flow invariably has a third heart sound, loud um, I mean, diastolic murmurs indicate slow murmurs. The systolic murmurs often is very, very li less prominent in the high pulmonary blood flow because the pressures in RV and LV are equal. Whereas in the tetralogy like situation, the systolic murmur is often more well heard and no diastolic murmurs heard. And the murmur here comes from the pulmonary stenosis 
the BSD being relatively silent. There's hardly any. I'm sorry, one second. What here? Uh, Hello, can you see me? I lost my... Can you hear me? Okay, can you see my slides? Okay, now? Now can you see my slides? Okay. Uh, now the systolic murmur in tetralogy comes from the pulmonary stenosis and the BSD is relatively silent due to the uh, equal pressures in the right and left ventricle. Now in the examination one of the most frequent questions asked is what is tetralogy physiology? Now remember the exam is in a clinical setting and The, and uh, what is being asked is what is the clinical definition of tetralogy physiology? It, it's not the it's not the anatomical definition. So whenever you are asked tetralogy physiology, please don't uh, start telling it's VSD and overriding iota. Tetralogy physiology is a combination of physical signs which indicate diminished pulmonary blood flow in a cyanotic patient. The degree of pulmonary stenosis determines how much blood is flowing into the heart, but in general the pulmonary blood flow is reduced and therefore it gives rise to the signs of central cyanosis. Because there is a VSD, the ventricle gets decompressed into the aorta and the ventricle does not enlarge. The heart size is relatively normal and the precardium is quiet. There is no cardiomegaly. The second sound is single, the A2 being the only component audible. Now pulmonary stenosis produces an ejection systolic murmur, but this murmur will be not very long and not very loud because most of the blood is going through the VSD into the aorta and less blood is going into the pulmonary artery. As the degree of pulmonary stenosis increases, the murmur will become more and more abbreviated and short. It will become softer because the pulmonary blood flow is reduced, there is no flow murmur across the tricuspid valve and mitral valve. Now this is what is called pathology physiology. A patient who is centrally cyanotic, who has got a no cardiomegaly, a quiet precardium and a relatively short and not so loud systolic murmur, no sign of increased pulmonary blood flow, this is what clinically is called tetralogy physiology. The most common diagnosis when you have this combination of finding is classical tetralogy of study. There are a few other conditions which can mimic tetralogy physiology and that we will be discussing subsequently. But having said that, tetralogy is the most common cyanotic heart disease. If you have a child who is more than one or two years old and he has tetralogy physiology on clinical examination, you can make a bet that 8 out of 10 such children will have the classical tetralogy of heart because all the others have a high mortality and get eliminated in the first one or two years. Therefore, tetralogy is the most common diagnosis and the name sticks tetralogy physiology. Okay? So be very clear what you want to say for that question. What is tetralogy physiology? Now as I said the severity of tetralogy essentially depends upon the severity of pulmonary stenosis. As the stenosis increases, the cyanosis increases and all the effects of cyanosis increases. Also remember in tetralogy as the cyanosis increases, the murmur becomes shorter and the most severe form of tetralogy there is no murmur. Now in clinical severity many more factors come in. So besides severity of pulmonary stenosis, there are dynamic changes. In addition to fixed pulmonary stenosis, there may be other times when there is spasm of the right ventricular outflow tract or there is systemic vasodilatation and therefore then acute drop in the pulmonary blood flow in a patient with which it is already reduced at rest. So they may have a cyanotic spell. Therefore severity may increase dynamically. The pulmonary stenosis is progressive 
At birth, it may not be so severe, it's progressive. Therefore, a patient with mildly cyanos tends to become more and more cyanos, and very often the adults are very severely polycythemic. One of the side effects of cyanosis is severe polycythemia, and age advances all the complications of polycythemia set in. The RV is hypoxic, hypertrophic, and under stress. Over a period of time, the right ventricle gets fibrotic changes and eventually it may manifest as myocardial dysfunction and right ventricular failure. The atria are under high pressure because the ventricular stiffness causes a high EDP and in adults, uh, very commonly the cause of atrial arrhythmia, both in the operated and in the unoperated patient. Aortic dilatation, it begins as a simple mechanical dilatation to increase the blood flow through the aorta. But then it has also been shown that the aorta in tetralogy shows degeneration in the uh, microscopic level and therefore the aorta actually progressively enlarges and in a few patients can enlarge the aneurysmal level. A dilatation and lack of support in the aortic valve also causes aortic regurgitation. The polycythemia may cause either thrombosis or bleeding or even both the events in the same patient. Neurological events are common in the polycythemic and hypoxic patient and the brain abscess are also particularly common in patients with right to left shunt in hypoxia. And of course, some of these patients have systemic dysmorphic features, that's something which adds to the severity. For example, a condition called 22Q micro deletion or the rejoice. Besides other systemic uh, features which I won't discuss now, in the heart, very often they have very unusually severe terminal artery anomalies. The right ventricular outflow tract is very hypoplastic, the annulus may be hypoplastic, and there may be severe branch stenosis or hypoplasia of the branches, and therefore the result in a D George may not be as good as in a non dysmorphic child. But therefore, while severity of PS determines the severity of pathology, all the factors which I have listed here contribute to the clinical severity and it is up to the cardiologist to check for each one of these and give it in the final report. Now there are a number of conditions which can mimic tetralogy of fallow or tetralogy physiology and you are familiar with the double out of right ventricular with pulmonary stenosis, tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia with VSD, pulmonary stenosis, Epstein anomaly, single ventricle. Now, there is a fundamental difference in all these conditions and uh, tetralogy of fallow. In tetralogy of fallow, the very important anatomical criterion is there are balanced right ventricle and left ventricle. Right ventricle is hypertrophy, pressures are equal and therefore the, the myocardial mass in the right ventricle and left ventricle are practically the same. Now that's a very important finding when it comes to electrocardiogram, X-ray and angiogram, etc. On the other hand, in double outer right ventricle tricuspid atresia, many of these conditions, one ventricle is more dominant. For example, in double outer right ventricle, most of the situations, the right ventricle is dominant. It's dominant over the left ventricle because it gives rise to both aorta and pulmonary artery. In a double outer right ventricle without pulmonary stenosis, the left ventricle will be dominant because it's receiving much more blood flow and all that blood flow has to go through the VST. Therefore, you often get more cardiac enlargement, more often not uh, left ventricular heat, and often the murmur is not soft or ejection systolic in the pulmonary area. You often get a longer systolic or even a pan systolic murmur uh, in the lower down in the sternal border. Therefore, what looks superficial like tetralogy is an unusually long murmur at a lower intercostal space, has an unusually palpable left ventricle. Think of a double out at right ventricle clinically. Tricuspid atresia, yes, is one of the causes of very severe cyanosis in the infant and high mortality. Again, in tricuspid atresia, right ventricle is hypoplastic. All the blood goes from right atrium to left atrium and all of it goes into the left ventricle. The left ventricle receives the entire pulmonary blood flow and the systemic blood flow. Therefore, by definition, tricuspid atresia is a left ventricular hyper. Uh, it's a hyperloaded condition. The left ventricle is overloaded and clinical findings will indicate uh, the apical impulse to suggest left ventricular hypertrophy, not right ventricular hypertrophy. 
The murmur in trichospiratory CI again arises from the ventricular septal defect, and therefore it will have the characteristic of a ventricular septal defect and not pulmonary stenosis. Pulmonary stenosis with ASD, the ventricular septum is intact. When the ventricular septum is intact and severe pulmonary stenosis develops, the right ventricle has to enlarge because there is no decompressing hole. The right ventricle will enlarge, therefore the heart size will be big, the right ventricular heave will be prominent, the murmur will be proportionate to the severe of the pulmonary stenosis. More severe is the pulmonary stenosis, more will be the murmur, unlike the tonic. Therefore, they often have a thrill in the pulmonary area, whereas a thrill practically rules out tetralogy of fallow. So, a very dominant right ventricle, think of isolated PS or think of double outer right ventricle. A BSD like murmur, think of double outer right ventricle, think of trichospinatresia. FCN phenomenon, everybody knows the findings cardiomegaly, very mild cyanosis, and multiple heart sounds. Ejection systolic murmur is not the predominant feature, it is more superficial, scratchy murmurs in the tricuspid area, both systolic and diastolic. Multiple heart sounds are very classical. It is very hard to mistake its exchange anomaly for tetralogy of salu clinically. And of course, single ventricle with tears can mimic any condition. Any ventricle can be hypertrophic clinically, I mean, I am talking clinically, it will mimic a, either RVH or LVH, it can also mimic biventricular hypertrophy. The murmurs are variable depending upon where the uh, outflow chamber is and so on. Therefore, it should be easy. I would, well, I would say easy. It should be possible to suspect clinically whether it is not tetralogy. You may not be able to make a definite diagnosis of non tetralogy, but you may suspect that maybe this is not tetralogy and I must be more careful before I send it to the surgeon. And that is where investigations help. Now, when do you suspect other diagnosis clinically? This is a summary of what I have been talking earlier. Suppose the second round is normally split and the patient is cyanosed. So, you want me to explain clinical features of what? Uh, I did not get your question. What do you want me to explain? Can you ask that question again? DORV, okay. Now, double outer right ventricle, the blood flow is comes, pulmonary vein pours into the LA and the LA fills into the LV. The entire cardiac output from the left ventricle, the oxygenated blood has to pass through the VSD into the RV and then go into either pulmonary artery or the aorta. Okay? So, the, here the clinical finding depends upon whether pulmonary blood flow is large. It also depends upon whether the VSD is small or large. Okay. Double outer right ventricle, both the right vessels are arriving from the right ventricle and therefore the right ventricle is always prominent. It is more prominent than an etatology of flalo in, the, in terms of heave in the right ventricle. Okay. Then when you palpate the heart, because the left ventricle had to pump through the VSD, the left ventricle also may be palpable. The apex may be hyperkinetic. The murmur may arise at the VSD level and therefore the murmur will not be soft, will not be ejection systolic. It will be more of a pan systolic character. It will be better heard lower down in the sternal border and maybe even towards the lower left sternal border or at the apex because the VSD is producing the murmur and not the pulmonary stenosis. Okay? It may not have a crescendo, decrescendo quality. Okay? So, you suspect non tetralogy diagnosis in a cyanotic patient, if the second round happens to be normal, the patient is cyanose and the second round is normally split, it cannot be tetralogy. If the patient has unusual cardiomegaly, if the patient's precordium is very active and the pulsations are very active, you know, apex is very hyperdynamic, RV is markedly heaving, if the murmur is very long or very loud or it is associated with thrill, again very unlikely to be tetralogy of cyanose. If there are diastolic murmurs, Diastolic murmurs in the form of mid diastolic murmur in the tricuspid valve or mid diastolic murmur in the mitral valve, is uncommon or unheard of in tetralogy of fallow. Unusual ECGs, I will discuss ECGs later on with examples, but if there are unusual rhythms, unusual axis, unusual patterns of hypertrophy, think of non tetralogy situation and again X ray. So, the most useful aspect of ECG and X ray 
they do not help to confirm the diagnosis of tetralogy of sun. They help to give you a clue that this patient may not have tetralogy. You understand? When you look at the ECG, you start thinking, oh, maybe this is not tetralogy of fallow. Therefore, when I do the echo, I have to be more careful. I have to look for other conditions. The DORB, maybe it's a uh, hypoplastic right ventricle. Maybe the left ventricle is not, not well developed. Something is unusual. If you have an unusual ECG, an unusual X-ray. Now, to know what is unusual ECG and X-ray, you must know what is expected in tetralogy of fallow. And these are some of the classical ECGs of uh, tetralogy of fallow. You are all familiar with tetralogy ECG. Um, the most important finding is there is mild right axis deviation. Mild means maybe up to 120, plus 120, uh, maybe even between 100 and 120. Axis can be uh, normal, maybe towards 90 also. So somewhere in the range of 90 to 120 is what you expect in classical tetralogy of fallow. If you have more extreme degrees of right axis deviation, 150 or 180 or um, right upper quadrant axis, think that it may not be tetralogy of fallow. Secondly, the other important feature is right ventricle hypertrophy. We all know that the right ventricle is hypertrophy in uh, tetralogy and therefore you have a R wave tall in V1 and you have a deep S wave in V6. But that's easy to diagnose. But there's something more, just a right ventricle hypertrophy is associated with what is called early transition. Now remember, in right ventricle hypertrophy of tetralogy, the cavity is small. The cavity is not enlarged. Therefore, the septum has not been displaced to the left. As a result, when you move from V1 to V2, you start picking up the left ventricular forces. Therefore, what is a pure R wave in V1 becomes a R with a deep S in as early as V2 or V3. So, normally the transition occurs in V3, V4. But here, the transition has happened as early as V2. This is called early transition. So the classical features of tetralogy in the ECG are normal to mild right axis deviation, not more than 120, right ventricular hypertrophy, and early transition of precordial lead from V1 to V2 or V3. By you must know what is transition, a pure R wave becoming an RS complex. This represents right ventricle, this represents both the ventricle for potentials. Is that clear? This is a very important finding and you people often fumble in the exam. Now, if you are clever, you can get some more information from this. The amount of pulmonary stenosis determines how much blood flow goes into the lungs. And that determines how much blood flow coming back to the LA. And that determines how much blood flow is coming back to the LV. Therefore, the degree of R wave in the V5 and V6 often gives you a clue as to how much the left ventricle is developed in tetralogy of fallow. For example, this is a condition where the pulmonary blood flow is very, very severely reduced and you see that right ventricle is dominant and there is hardly any left ventricular forces. Now, even the ECG is telling you that it is a severe tetralogy of fallow. There are hardly any LV forces here. Okay? Now, look at this ECG. This is also a tetralogy of fallow. Right axis deviation, maybe about uh, 120, 110 or 120, there is right ventricular hypertrophy, there is uh, early transition, but then you see very good R waves in V5 and V6 and the S wave has already disappeared. Therefore, this is also tetralogy of fallow, but the left ventricular forces are well developed unlike this ECG. Therefore, the, this ECG suggests severe tetralogy of fallow, where the second ECG suggests the tetralogy may not be that severe, okay? So the ECG is a useful diagnosis in suspecting other diagnosis. You can also be smart and assess whether the right ventricle is well developed and uh, the left ventricle is well developed or not. Okay, if, there, if you have any questions, please put up your question. That's the milder tetralogy of fallow, second one, okay? Now look at these ECGs. These are also patients who look like tetralogy on clinical examination, quite hard, and uh, you know, 
clinically a systolic murmur and the single second sound is easily passed them off as tetralogy of cyanide. But when you look at the ECG, something more. The axis is not rightward. It's more. What's the axis here? Can anybody answer quickly? One is positive and AVF is negative. Yes, Ronak, you're right. The it's minus 30. It's left axis deviation. Now that's extremely uh, unlikely to be tetralogy of phallo. Tetralogy of phallo does not have left axis deviation unless there's something else happening. Now I'm not talking of combinations like tetralogy with AV canal defect and all that. We won't go into the the combinations at the moment. But when you talk of uh, simple isolated lesion, left axis deviation rules of tetralogy of phallo. Now look at the precordial lead. Is that right ventricular hypertrophy? No. There is no left ventricular hyper, uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. On the other hand, you have deep left ventricular forces. And deep S waves in V1, V2, and tall R waves in V5 and V6. So there is left axis deviation, left ventricular hypertrophy, and right atrial enlargement. Can you see that? Right, right atrium is peaked and tall, about 4 millimeters tall P wave, right atrial hypertrophy. So what, is, what comes to your mind? Which is cyanotic heart disease where the left ventricle is large and the right atrium is hypertrophy? Try to put it trivia. That's simple. If you know the hemodynamic, the ECG tells you the diagnosis. So that's how you think. So the patient may look like the told your fellow, but the ECG tells you it is not tetralogy, it's like pretrivia. Now look at this ECG. Again, another cyanotic patient. But here I have uh, a patient with sinus rhythm, left axis deviation, but I have both right ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular hypertrophy. Wow. You have uh, RBB and RVH pattern here, and you have biventricular hypertrophy. Yes, AV canal defect is possible, but then uh, we are talking of pure cyanotic conditions now. AV canal defect by definition goes into acyanotic heart disease unless they have something else. Yes, biventricular hypertrophy, think of double outer right ventricle. Think of single ventricle. Anything which doesn't fit a classical diagnosis can always be single ventricle or double outer right ventricle. So think of more complex conditions. This is not tetralogy, this is not trichopodetry. The right ventricular hypertrophy is unusual, unlikely to be trichopodetry here. This biventricular hypertrophy, the DORV things and the left axis deviation. Okay. So that's how you suspect it is not tetralogy of fellow. Now come on quickly, well, I give you a chance to answer that. what does the ECG show here? Yes, the first one shows complete heart block and the second one also shows complete heart block with uh, A to Z. So what condition comes to your mind? In a patient who looks like tetralogy also, yes, that's the way. So if you have a, if you have a congenitally corrected transposition and he has a ventricular septal defect and he has pulmonary stenosis, he will have exactly findings of tetralogy of fallow. But this is how the ECG will look like if he has heart block or he may, have, he may not have complete heart block. He may have just a first degree heart block as seen in this ECG. Can you see the first degree heart block? The PR interval is just above normal. So here is a patient who has congenitally corrected transposition and first degree heart block. These are small clues to you. In addition, the ECG is not suggestive of tetralogy. There is left axis deviation again and there is no right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, more of uh, LV, uh, left sided ventricular predominant. But although the left ventricle is predominant here, can you see that there is no Q wave in V5 and V6? Look, there is no Q wave in V5 and V6. On the other hand, there is a small R here, now, uh, but I don't see a Q here. Well, so it doesn't fit at all, just fellow and the prolonged PR interval. Think of a uh, congenitally corrected transposition. So that's how that's how you make a uh, you know, detect, detective uh, diagnosis. Let's go to the X-ray. Everybody is familiar with the tetralogy X-ray, the boot-shaped heart, but you must be able to explain what a boot-shaped heart is. Now you know a boot is a military shoe where uh, one moment here. Yes. So the there you can see the 
heart has a rounded lifted apex which very suggests a right ventricular hypertrophy. You see that the pulmonary segment is completely concave, concave, indicating that the main pulmonary artery and RV infundibulum are small. And you can see that the lungs are hyper, uh, hypovolemic, hardly any blood vessels seen in the lung field and the blood vessels appear to be extremely thin. And the ascending aorta seems to be prominent, this, this convex shadow here is the ascending aorta. So this is a classical boot shaped heart. The boot shaped heart is caused by the mild cardiac enlargement, not severe mild cardiac enlargement, the right ventricular type of rounded AFA and more importantly this concave pulmonary artery segment. So this is what forms the boot, the military boot. Okay. So this is classical tetralogy of fallow. However, this is not diagnostic of tetralogy of fallow. There are some few conditions which can mimic this, but you have to be careful. But if you say tetralogy, you are probably going to be correct anyway. Okay. Now, one of the most common associations with tetralogy of fallow is right aortic arch, and you can see the dense shadow on the right side here. But the more important thing is to see the oblique shadow of the descending aorta joining the spine here, obliquely joining the spine. Normally you would see this oblique line on the left side like this here. You can also see a small, a small indentation in the trachea of the right aortic arch. So, so this is also another boot shaped heart, concave pulmonary artery segment, uh, oligemic lungs and a right aortic arch. Very often when the aortic arch is on the right side, it pushes the superior vena cava further to the right and you may see a superior vena cava outside the right aortic arch here. Okay. So these are some classical examples of tetralogy of fallow. In adult tetralogy, they often develop numerous collaterals and one of the X-ray signs of collateral is to have multiple mottled appearance in the uh, lung, especially in the lower lobe. Can you see this? The overall vasculature is reduced, but the hilum and the perihilar region show multiple uh, vessels as well as uh, small nodular structures. So this together is called a mottled appearance and this in an older patient suggests that there may be multiple collaterals. Please read up the, where, do, where the collaterals come from in the tetralogy of fallow and how, how, how they are classified. Well, there are other cyanotic heart disease patients where the x-ray tells you that it may not be tetralogy. Now look at the first x-ray. Here you have cardiomegaly, the heart apex is touching the chest wall. It is a rounded apex, so it, it qualifies for right ventricular hypertrophy. The pulmonary artery segment is concave, so everything looks like tetralogy so far, but the pulmonary blood flow is grossly increased. Okay? It's severe pulmonary plethora and, and even pulmonary edema, I would say. We see that the, the whole pulmonary field is hazy and the interstitium is uh, a ground glass appearance. Therefore, it is a case of cardiomegaly looking like tetralogy of fallow, but actually having an increased pulmonary blood flow. Therefore, it is anything but tetralogy of fallow. Okay? So, no, I am not going into what it can be. Whenever you have cardiomegaly plethora, and you don't see a prominent pulmonary artery. Always plethora should produce a prominent pulmonary artery. If it doesn't produce a prominent pulmonary artery here, it indicates either the pulmonary artery is absent, main pulmonary artery is absent, like in truncus. In truncus, sometimes pulmonary artery comes from the aorta and the main pulmonary artery is absent. Or it can also be a condition like uh, transposition, double outer right ventricle, where the pulmonary artery is not present in its normal location and is shifted more medially here. Okay. Now look at this X-ray. Cardiomegaly again, uh, apex, something like LV, and some features of RV also because it is dipping into the diaphragm, possibly biventricular hypertrophy. Main pulmonary artery not present in its normal location, plethora, and the right aortic arch. No, superficially speaking, it looked like tetralogy, but the plethora is quite prominent and this vessel appears to be coming a little higher than usual. But think of other unusual conditions and one may be a truncus. 
trunk, you know, biventricular hypertrophy, concave pulmonary artery segment, plethora, right aortic arch, and somewhat high origin of the pulmonary artery. Think of truncus. X ray is not diagnostic, but think of non tetralogy conditions. This x ray is another textbook x ray, what is called a box shaped heart. Look at the right atrium, it has a shape of a box, a square. The right atrium is alloy, right? And the superior vena cava is alloy. Superior vena. The iota is just inside, but the straight border is superior vena. Superior vena cava is large. The RA is big. The rest of it looks like the tall of fellow, concave pulmonary artery segment, rounded apex, and oligemic lungs. So, oligemic lungs is a prominent RA and SVC. Think of tricuspid atresia. Okay? Tricuspid atresia. Yes, one guess at what this can be? Quick. Who can talk? Yes, correct. You see that convex bulge on the left upper cardiac border is a classical signing of the L malpost aorta. Therefore, whether it is a congenitally corrected transposition or single ventricle or double outer right ventricle, the aorta is L malpost and forming the left upper cardiac border. And therefore, uh, if the X-ray tells you that this is not a tertiary fellow. And yes, quick. What is this X-ray? Come on. Yes, DTPA, egg on side appearance. Now you must know what is egg on side appearance. See, all all heart shadows are eggs. There's no heart which is not an egg. Okay. Now this is called egg because the heart, as usual, resembles an egg, but the pedicle is narrow, you know? and the main reason is the pulmonary artery is missing from its usual location. They are placed one behind the other, iota is in front, PA is behind, and therefore the na media channel is narrow. So if you have an egg shaped out on its side, some cardiomegaly, a narrow vascular pedicle, and plethoric lungs, that goes in favor of trans transposition of great artery. Mind you, this sign is helpful only in the infant. Secondly, if you have an egg on side appearance, the thora, and if you have a white superior media stenum, it's not, it's not transposition. If you have an egg on side appearance, if you have a narrow pedicle, and you have oligemic lungs, again, it's unlikely to be classical transposition of great artery. So, egg on side is a very fixed combination of the egg shaped heart, narrow pedicle, plethoric lungs in an infant. Okay, please don't say egg on side heart in an adult who is fine also. Now, it's one thing to diagnose tetralogy of fallow. Anybody can write tetralogy, refer to, refer to frontier lifeline hospitals. That's very easy for a GP or a pediatrician to write. The cardiologist has a lot more responsibility. He has to identify many other factors which influence treatment. For example, Classically, there is only one BSD, so this, you may have multiple BSDs and therefore you have to identify the number of BSDs. You have to identify the degree of override. If it is more than 70 or 90 percent, you have to warn the surgeon that it may be a double outright right condition. You have to identify the nature of the RV outflow narrowly, how, how narrow is the annulus, whether it reads a transcellular patch, whether the valve is mobile or not, whether the main pulmonary artery is developed. What is the size of the annulus? What is the size of the branches? Whether the branches are supplying all segments of the lung. What is the course of the proximal coronary artery? And is the RCA or LCA crossing the right ventricular outflow tract? In that case, the surgeon will not be able to open the right ventricular outflow. And of course, certain associated lesions are quite common in tetralogy of fallow. And I mentioned some of them earlier, uh, that is aortic dilatation, AR. But also, always look for associated ASDs. PDAs, collaterals from the descending aorta, and aortic incompetence. Now, all these factors are part of your diagnosis. I get very, very upset when somebody presents a case and I ask what's the diagnosis, 
tetralogy of phallo and then stays coined. Then there is no difference between a cardiologist and a general practitioner. As cardiologists, you are expected to give more information. Now that's where echo comes in. Now echo has practically replaced the angiogram for a diagnosis, and I, I, I'm not going to describe echo in uh, detail. But one of the most common uh, points in echo, which you pick up uh, as soon as you start doing the echo, in the long axis view of the heart, where you see a large subaortic VFC, you can see that the aorta is overriding the uh, ventricular septum and appears to arise partly from the left ventricle. However, most of the aorta is still committed to the left ventricle. The aortic valve and the mitral valve are uh, continuous with each other, fibrous continuity, and the, they are not more than a few millimeters away. Therefore, this is one of the most important uh, initial clue to tetralogy of valve. When you start doing the apical four chamber view and you tilt the transducer anteriorly, you often open up both the great arteries and you can see, you will see the aorta and the ventricular septal defect and in front of the aorta, you see the classical anatomical uh, finding of the tetralogy of valve. This is the infundibular septum. Infundibular septum by definition is the muscular septum which lies between the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve at that point. And now you can see instead of being midway between the aorta and pulmonary artery, it is deviated anteriorly and superiorly from A to P. It moves from aorta towards the pulmonary artery and as a result, you can see that the right ventricular outward tract is quite narrow. So you can see the RA, tricuspid valve, RB, the, through the VSD, the aorta and the infundibular septum deviated anteriorly and superiorly giving rise to infundibular stenosis. You can see the bifurcation, but you have better views to delineate that in uh, from other windows. Okay. Now, in the short axis, you see the same feature. You can see the infundibular septum between the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve is deviating into the right ventricle and causing narrowing here. That's the fundamental form of pulmonary stenosis in the tetralogy of valve. In addition, you can have further stenosis in the RBOT, in the annulus, in the pulmonary valve. Sometimes the main pulmonary artery and sometimes bifurcation and branch PA are also stenosis in addition to the infundibular stenosis. But the infundibular stenosis is the hallmark of the tetralogy of valve. So ECHO gives you all that information. It tells you the number and location of the VST, tells you the nature of RVOT obstruction. It can help you make all the uh, measurements of dimensions and it can also help to tell you the anatomy and hemodynamics by color doctor. Now, subcostal sagittal view is a very important view to show the catastrophe. Here you see the VSD and the overriding aorta here. You can see the conti continuity between the mitral valve and the, uh, and the aortic valve here. When you have color doctor on the screen, you see that the, uh, the aorta receives blood both from the LV and the RV here. When you scan the sagittal section more towards the left side, the, you can see that the VSD is seen and the VSD is produced by the anterior superior deviation of the infundibular septum and this deviation into the RVOT causes subalvular narrowing here. This is the subalvular narrowing. Okay? So, and the, the color doctor confirms it. That's the ventricular septal defect. See that there is hardly any turbulence at the VSD. Therefore, the pressures in both the ventricles are equal. And that also means that the VSD is silent, it does not produce any murmur in tetralogy of cell. The murmur comes from the turbulence in the right ventricular output tract and that is the cause of the systolic murmur due to pulmonary stenosis. Okay? So you should be explained all these findings in the examination if you are shown an echo of tetralogy of cell. Now, these are all very simple things, very basic things, but students often fumble in the way they explain and when they report a echo finding. Now what are the components of diagnosis? As I said, the cardiologist's responsibility is more than simply saying it's a tetralogy of cell. You have to diagnose and exclude the all differential diagnosis. You have to comment on the severity of the tetralogy of cell. Severe mild, it's severe with complications, severe with symptoms. What are the associated lesions? What are the dysmorphic features associated with it? There are some variants of the tetralogy of fellow 
and also the surgeon needs some basic anatomical details like annulus diameter, the, the size of the branch pulmonary artery, the coronary anatomy and these features you have to provide in your echo diagnosis. There are some variants which I will just mention briefly I do not intend to go into the details. So, near artery tetralogy is often uh, anatomically milder than other tetralogy in the sense the degree of hypertrophy, the degree of narrowing is often less than other tetralogy. But the patient in near artery tetralogy may be more symptomatic because it is often a very uh, hypercontractile infundibulum, it is a hyper reactive infundibulum and very often the neonate the PDA closes and therefore the pulmonary blood flow drops up. Uh, abruptly. Therefore, a neonatal technology may be very symptomatic, but very often the stenosis may not be anatomically very severe. Now, I won't go into the details of how to diagnose and manage, but just remember that neonatal technology has much less muscle in the right ventricle, and therefore, um, one of the one of the arguments for operating early is that they require less muscle resection and maybe the right ventricular function can be preserved. Now, oriental tetralogy of fallow is a variant described in the Asian and the Eastern population. It is just an anatomical variation where the infundibular septum, the classical anatomical abnormality of tetralogy is a very thick hypertrophied infundibular septum. However, some people found that um, the the infundibular septum in the Asian population and the Japanese population, Eastern population is not very hypertrophic. The infundibular septum is often small or hypoplastic and the cause of the stenosis may be predominantly at the annular level. So, this variety has been called oriental tetralogy of fallow. So, this is an important examiner, examiners may be sometimes inclined to ask you what is oriental TOF. The oriental TOF is nothing but tetralogy of fallow with a very small or hypoplastic infundibular septum. Now, the importance is for the surgeon. The surgeon has to know that the infundibular septum is often is less prominent in these cases and therefore, they know that they may they have to be more careful when they anchor the patch in the region of the infundibular septum. Adult tetralogy of fallow often quite symptomatic, very severe RV hypertrophy. But often the pulmonary arteries are very good size because the very fact that they have grown into adult age means originally they were mild tetralogy cephal and that the pulmonary arteries must have been well developed. But over a period of time they become severe because of progressive right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, when the progressive right ventricular hypertrophy, more cyanosis, more polycythemia, and they have all the complications of tetralogy cephal. They have RV, they may have RV dysfunction. They may have right heart failure, they may have aortic aneurysm in a small number by percentage, they may have aortic incompetence, they may have atrial arrhythmia, they may have brain abscess, all the complications of polycythemia and tetralogy of well. Now, that is what makes adult tetralogy more important and more difficult to treat. Examiners are very fond of adult tetralogy of fallow, please read up about it. Also, cases kept in the examination always tend to be an older child or an adult. Therefore, the, the discussion on adult talk will always happen in the examination. Please read it up and please be prepared for questions. Tetralogy of absent pulmonary valve is another variant. Here, the pulmonary valve leaflets are often uh, poorly developed. They are nodular and dysplastic. The predominant feature is incompetence. Stenosis is relatively uh, milder or moderate and it is mainly due to the annular narrowing and the bulk of the leaflets being immobile. Therefore, it is tetralogy, but it is a variant and it has quite different clinical findings in the sense they present more like increased pulmonary blood flow symptoms. They have x-rays with large pulmonary arteries and they have two and from one. So, tetralogy absent pulmonary valve more often mimics conditions with increased pulmonary blood flow and is a separate subset altogether. But on the overall, it is better to remember that these four are the variants of the tetralogy of fallow 
which you have to know and you might be prepared to answer questions. The other tetralogy as I mentioned may have unusual degree of cardiac enlargement. The iota is often massively dilated, it may even become aneurysmal, tetralogy patients are known to have dissections because the iota is so dilated and they may have severe air. This patient had both aortic aneurysm and severe air. So the X-ray is more like a AR patient than like the tetralogy of Salo. Now what are the indications for CAT? We do not do CAT in majority of patients the tetralogy of Salo. They, are, they go for surgery on the basis of echo. However, occasionally we do, in, do CAT. Uh, well, one indication is sometimes we do to train candidates, but then that is not a clinical indication. The main indication for cardiac CAT is if the anatomy is not clear on echo, with poor echo window very often as an adult the echo window is poor and especially if we are not sure about the PA bright size, we are not sure about the coronary anatomy, collaterals in descending iota are often difficult to see and if we have doubts about multiple VST. Therefore, in a small subset of patients where the anatomy is not clear or if you are planning to do a catheter intervention, if you have a neonate cyanosis and you 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 are in a place where you, a, a surgical palliation is not available or uh, your cath lab has a program of uh, tetralogy palliation, then maybe you can do a cath and balloon dilatation. Uh, we often, we sometimes do right ventricular outflow stenting or we stent the pulmonary artery. All these are palliative measures in tetralogy of pal. Therefore, uh, the indication for cath to define anatomy in a difficult patient and to do catheter intervention if necessary. Right. Now I have no time to go into the the angiographic method and detail, but you must know. Although angiogram is not done frequently, you must know the common views and angiograms done. The one of the main purposes of the angiogram is to show the pulmonary artery anatomy and the RBO problem. Therefore, the right ventricular angiogram is necessary and here we see a venous catheter from right atrium to right ventricle showing right ventricle there is infundibular stenosis and then you see the PA and filling on the pulmonary artery. So it tells you details of right ventricular function, the details of the pulmonary artery anatomy, the pulmonary artery and PA branches. It also tells you there is a right aortic arch because the iota is filling through the VST and it shows the uh, great vessel and a right aortic right arch. Now, uh, please don't comment on the BSD in the frontal view because the ventricular septum is facing you and you will not be able to um, uh, identify the location of the BSD. The LV is behind the RV in frontal view. So, do not comment on the BSD. We know that there is a BSD because iota is filling, but do not comment on the BSD in frontal view. Now, in this view, if you notice, the right pulmonary artery is seen well, whereas the left pulmonary artery is not seen. It is going curving down and going behind the heart. Therefore, a simple straight frontal view is not a good way of showing branch PA. So we do what is called a cranial angulation. When you do a pulmonary artery angle in the frontal view with cranial angulation, you open out the PA. Can you see this? This pulmonary artery is going straight behind the MPA and curling down, and the cranial angulation is helpful. Therefore, either you do a RV angio with, with frontal and cranial angulation or you do a pulmonary artery angio with cranial angulation. The idea is to show the branch PA, the sizes, the, whether it is supplying all the segments of the lung. And if you do that, you may find that in addition to infundibular and valvular stenosis, the right pulmonary artery or the left pulmonary artery is stenosis. Uh, this may need enlargement by the surgeon at the time of operation. We do not do angiogram for showing the BSD, but as the students going up for exam and the occasional patient, you have to demonstrate the BSD and we do a left ventricular angiogram in the left anterior oblique view. The left anterior oblique view is always combined with the cranial angulation to elongate the septum. You can see the classical subiotic BSD is mild override. This negative shadow is the mitral valve and there is the iotomitral continuity here. And you can see the aortic valve is outlined 
forming the roof of the ventricular facility site. If the apex is included in the angio, you will be able to rule out other locations of the ventricular facility site. So, please remember what angios are done and what views are utilized in a classical tetralogy style. Right ventricular angio, frontal with cranial angulation. Left ventricular angio, left anterior oblique view and cranial angulation. I've already talked for pulmonary artery angio. If, if RV angio doesn't show the PS, please enter the pulmonary artery or RV OT and do an injection with cranial tilt. Occasionally, you can also take the help of other imaging. So they are not, uh, uh, you may show the pulmonary artery branch anatomy equally well by a, a CT angio or MRI these days. And here you see a, a good depiction of pulmonary artery anatomy by MRI. You can see that the pulmonary arteries are well developed here. The CT angio would be equally good, and you can also see that there is a standard stenosis of the main pulmonary artery, there is hypoplasia of the right pulmonary artery all the way as compared to the left pulmonary artery. So there is stenosis in the MPA, there is stenosis in the bifurcation, and there is stenosis of the entire, and uh, hypoplasia of the entire RPA. Now, the structures in the posterior media stenum, such as the collaterals, are also impossible to show by echocardiogram, and therefore, if you are really thinking of um, uh, collaterals in a patient, especially if the pulmonary atresia, you often need imaging by either a conventional angiogram or a, a CT angio or by MR angiogram. And the MR angiogram in this case shows multiple collaterals as well as the intrapulmonary branch piece. Now, one of the most important uh, determinant of right ventricular outflow tract repair is whether any coronary artery is crossing the pulmonary artery. Now, if the right coronary artery or the left coronary artery crosses the right ventricular outflow, then the surgeon cannot repair the tetralogy cell. Now, here is the short axis of the uh, tetralogy patient. You can see that the anterior sinus gives off the right coronary artery here. So you can see a large artery arising from the right coronary artery and going across the right ventricular outflow here. This is the right ventricular outflow going into the pulmonary artery, right? So you see a large coronary artery crossing the right ventricular outflow into the anterior surface of the left ventricle. Therefore, if such a large branch, it's, it's unlikely to be just a large coronal branch and I suspect that this may be a left anterior descending artery coming from the right coronary artery. You could have a RCA coming from the left anterior descending artery this way. So, the echo is a good guide to tetralogy coronary anatomy if the windows are reasonable. Sometimes the echo windows are not sufficient and then you have to go towards angiogram. Now, here is the frontal view of the iotogram. Of course, there is a right aortic arch, there is an aberrant left subclavian artery and other things. But the most important thing I want to show you here is. Okay, look at the left sinus giving off the left coronary artery, a lady, the circumflex, and there is a large artery arising, crossing in front of the RVOT. How do you know it's crossing? You can see it goes up, convex course on the RV, because the pulmonary artery is lying here. The pulmonary artery is lying right over this area, and therefore the LAD is crossing in front of the RVOT and crossing to the right AV group. So this is an example of the right coronary artery arising from the left anterior descending artery. When you repair tetralogy, you can't cut the RCA either, then the RV will not function. Uh, of course, nowadays a CT angio would also show the anatomy, uh, coronary anatomy. Here is an example of a single coronary artery from the right sinus. See this, there is a right sinus, the same common origin and the RCA goes to the right AV groove and you see the left coronary artery coming from the same sinus crossing to the left and then dividing into LAD and circumflex. It's an example of uh, a single coronary artery from the left, uh, right side. Huh? The pulmonary outflow tag would lie in the middle here. Is that here? Therefore, you, if you want to repair the RVOT, you can't cut that area, and this patient invariably needs a con need a conduit. They need a conduit to jump from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, like this. Okay. So it's important to show the coronary anatomy by echo or by angio or by CT scan or by MRI. It's up to you what you choose and what is available in your center, but you need to give that information. Once you have done all this diagnosis, 
Now, this is what I call a complete diagnosis of tetralogy of Okay. I, I, would, I would give good marks if somebody presents a case to me like this. This is a patient with tetralogy of Thilo, severe form. He has hyperplastic annulus, adequate branch PA5. LPA, adequate right pulmonary artery size, origin stenosis of the left pulmonary artery, right aortic arch, possible 22Q micro deletion syndrome, normal proximal coronary with nothing crossing the right ventricular outflow tract, no spells clinically but has severe polycythemia, no other associated lesions except right aortic arch, he is in sinus rhythm and I think he is suitable for total repair with enlargement of the annulus, main pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery. Now, if you give a diagnosis like that at the end of your workup, uh, no more questions, you are a master. Okay? Now, that's what I mean by complete diagnosis of tetralogy of failure. Please try to achieve that degree of completeness whenever you talk of diagnosis in tetralogy of failure. Okay? And I think that's my last slide. So, uh, maybe two minutes if somebody has any burning questions. There's nothing new in what I have told to you today. All this has been told to you each and every teaching session on cyanotic heart disease in your respective centers by your teachers. I've just revised the entire uh, chapter on diagnosis of pathology. But please remember these points and remember to answer properly when you're asked these questions. Yes, any questions? Two minutes. But you have to be fast.